Good morning and welcome to the Wilson Center. Uh, my name is Abe Denmark. I'm the Vice President for Programs and Director of Studies. Uh, and today we are thrilled to kick off the uh, conference for our second year for the uh, Wilson China Fellowship. And uh, we're starting with a terrific panel um, of uh, people I've worked with for a long time and a really excellent group of thinkers on the United States, and our role in the world and our relationship with China. Uh, joining us today uh, first is uh, my boss, Ambassador Mark Green, who's the President and CEO of the Wilson Center, uh, formerly Administrator of USAID. Uh, we also joining us is uh, Mike Lampton, who's the Professor Emeritus of China Studies at the Johns Hopkins School of uh, uh, Advanced International Studies and a Senior Fellow at the Foreign Policy Institute. Uh, we also have Stephen Del Rosso, who's the Program Director for International Peace and Security at the Carnegie Corporation of New York, uh, and my old friend, uh, Lauren Rosenberger, who's a Special Assistant to the President of the United States and Senior Director for China and Taiwan on the National Security Council at the White House. Uh, so we're thrilled to have all of you here. It's great to see all of you. And we'll start uh, with some opening remarks by Ambassador Mark Green. Great, thanks Abe for that kind introduction and uh, welcome everyone to the Wilson Center. As Abe said, I'm Mark Green, President and CEO. Uh, it really is my pleasure today to welcome you all to this opening session of the second annual Wilson China Fellowship Conference. Over the past year, our 25 fellows have conducted groundbreaking research into the rise of China and US-China relations. I'm excited about the upcoming presentations and I know I'm not alone. China has emerged as the primary rival to the US and perhaps our greatest foreign policy challenge for the 21st century. Everybody understands that. That's the easy part. The rest, understanding China itself, its interests and its ambitions, that's harder and that's where we're still lacking. Veritable armies of American scholars devoted their careers to understanding the Soviet Union during the Cold War and translating that knowledge into actionable ideas for policymakers. The size of American scholarship on China, on the other hand, is relatively limited and too often isolated from the policymaking process. And that's why this fellowship is so important for the US and why the Wilson Center is well positioned to nurture the next generation of American scholarship on China. The Wilson Center was chartered by Congress some five decades ago for, in their words, the purpose of strengthening the fruitful relation between the world of learning and the world of public affairs. While many institutes and organizations deal in data and information, Congress asked us to go further into scholarship and learning. That's much harder, and I would say that's much more important. Now, uh, I, I want to begin today by pointing out that this work, as important as it is, would not be possible without the support and leadership of our friends at the Carnegie Corporation of New York, and especially Stephen Del Rosso, Program Director of Carnegie's International Peace and Security Program. I hope you'll join me in welcoming Steve here today and thanking him for Carnegie's generosity and its dedication to the study of peace and US-China relations. So Steve, I'll turn it over to you for a few words. Thank you, Ambassador. That's uh, very nice words. I very much appreciate it. I also want to extend my thanks to the entire Woodrow Wilson team for uh, inviting me to this event. I'm very pleased to attend it again and to say a few words before the main event. To say the least, it's been an eventful year in world affairs, um, even as many of us have been hunkered down in our homes in the age of COVID. Sino-American tensions have only increased during this period as war drums are sounding in Eastern Europe and relations between China and Russia grow closer with implications that are still unfolding. As mentioned, I direct the International Peace and Security Program at the Carnegie Corporation of New York. The Grant Making Foundation established 111 years ago with the mandate to promote the advancement and diffusion of knowledge and understanding. As such, it's not surprising that much of our grant making has supported academic research. 
The International Peace and Security Program deals with a wide range of issues from nuclear security to relations with Russia, track to unofficial dialogue with Iran, North Korea, developments in the Arab world, peace building in Africa, bridging the gap between the academy and policy worlds, congressional education, and most relevant to this conference, of course, China. We remain the largest private funder of China studies in the US. About a decade ago, we commissioned a needs assessment of the field to help guide our grant making. The study highlighted three main needs. First, to replenish the bench of senior China experts who retired or left the scene. Uh, second, to better understand China's domestic and foreign policy, something that Ambassador Green has underscored. And third, to promote engagement with Chinese experts and policy officials. Now, to address these needs over the past decade, we've supported a, various programs from Columbia University's China and the World Program to the National Committee on US-China Relations Public Intellectuals PIP Program and the National Bureau of Asian Research, Research's Chinese Language Fellowships and many others, from which, as I understand, some of today's current Wilson China Fellows have also benefited. A new study that we commissioned last year reaffirmed the continued relevance of these needs, as well as highlighting the additional need for more research on such themes as the role of emerging technology in China, ethnic minority issues, non-traditional security topics, including the environment, public health, and relations with third countries, including Russia among others. Now, the study also bemoaned the increasingly restrictive political environment in China under President Xi, which this audience knows well, that has, that has limited the ability of American and other researchers and journalists to work in the country and interact safely with their Chinese sources and counterparts. <laughs> All this, of course, has been exacerbated by visa and COVID restrictions and a security-heavy discourse in China and the U.S., that has politicized research and contributed to an environment of mutual mistrust and suspicion. By the way, uh, this study and all our grants related to China can be found on Carnegie's website. So we are painfully aware of these new challenges, but also believe that now more than ever, there is a need for nuanced understanding of this rising power and constructive engagement with the United States, despite the headwinds. The Woodrow Wilson China Fellows Program is one of our key efforts to advance this goal. I look forward to hearing from the real China experts who will speak after me on this morning's panel and, of course, during the next two days of this conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Um, we'll turn now to uh, Laura Rosenberger uh, from the National Security Council. Um, I understand she is sitting under the portrait of our first Secretary of War, Henry Knox. And instead of a message about American intentions, I think it's better that to remember that Henry Knox was also the founder of the Society of the Cincinnati. And we thought that Cincinnati could use some support today after a tough loss in the Super Bowl last night. Uh, so we'll turn things now over to Laura. Go ahead, please. Well, uh, thanks, Abe, and, and thanks to everybody uh, for inviting me to join for this really important conversation this morning. And, um, Abe knows that starting with a football reference isn't always always a good way to, to get me going. Um, this Steelers fan was was pulling for the Bengals last night. Uh, uh, was sorry to see how things uh, shook out there in the end. Um, but one day Cincinnati too will will have a have a ring. Um, but anyways, uh, you know we're here not to talk about competition on the football field, but to talk about um, competition between the United States and, and China. Um, and you know when when we look at um, U.S.-China relations from the the seat of the Biden administration, our uh, belief is that we are in the early stages of a long-term and intense competition uh, between the United States and China. Um, one that really crosses um, you know, the military domain, the technological domain, um, the economic space, political domain. It's, it's um, playing out uh, in pretty much every region across the world, probably most intensely in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, where the United States has a deep and abiding interest and where we uh, just last Friday released uh, our Indo-Pacific strategy, which pr uh, presents our affirmative um, approach for the region. Um, but this is a competition um, that, you know, in many ways um, is going to determine um, the, the course of the you know, future rules of the road of the, of the 21st century. Um, and we believe that uh, the next decade will be decisive in determining if it's the United States and our allies and partners um, who are able to, to write and shape those rules um, or whether it is, is China. 
um, and as Stephen noted, um, increasingly in alignment with, with Russia in articulating what that alternative worldview um, might look like. Um, the United States approach um, to dealing with this competition is premised on a few uh, particular points that I would, would just emphasize. The first um, is a recognition um, of our limited ability uh, to change China. Um, and therefore, the thrust of our um, emphasis and policy focus is really on shaping the environment around China um, so that it is a terrain that advantages the United States um, and our allies and partners um, and, again, allows us uh, to um, maintain and, and secure for the future a balance of influence and shaping power um, that will allow us to continue to provide for the kind of um, peace and stability globally um, that we have, have seen in, in the past several decades. Um, in order to advance those objectives, then, um, we uh, are really focused on um, how to prosecute that competition, how to engage in that competition in a way that allows us to, to have the, the strongest hand. Um, and Abe's heard my football analogies a few times, but uh, you'll have to bear with me once again. Um, you know, every uh, football team knows that you can't show up with just a defense. Um, you've got to have an offense as well. Even this, you know, Steelers fan over here knows um, that as much as we, we love our defense, you've got to have an offense to win. And so that means really actually starting um, our, our approach um, to China policy by investing here in ourselves at home. And that is across, um, you know, the technological space, the economic space. In the past year, obviously, a lot of work around COVID recovery, strengthening our democracy. Um, all these key pieces mean, um, you know, strengthening the, the hand that we're playing, the offensive game that we're bringing to the field. Um, but football is a team sport, and, and so is foreign policy and international relations. Um, and lining up our friends and, and allies and partners um, as part of a common approach, um, really aligning with what we're doing so that when we throw the long ball, the receiver's down there to catch it um, is incredibly important as well. Um, I think sometimes when we talk about aligning with our allies and partners in the context of competition with China, uh, people think that we're talking about assembling an anti-China coalition and that this is all about countering. Um, and I would actually argue that that really misses the point. And I referenced the Indo-Pacific strategy that we released last week. Um, and Secretary Blinken, of course, was also in uh, Australia uh, last week meeting with the, the Quad foreign ministers. And so much of the work that we're doing in, in those spaces in aligning with our allies and partners is really about putting forward our shared vision for the future, advancing the values and principles, the interests that we collectively bring to the table um, that we believe uh, will actually um, secure peace and stability and security um, for, uh, for the world's people uh, as well as for our own. Now, of course, you know, that also includes countering China's worst abuses um, collectively when we, when we need to. Um, but you know, we believe, again, that, that it's about that, that offensive play. And then between, um, you know, along with those efforts, you know, investing in ourselves and aligning with allies and partners, we believe that positions us to, to outcompete China. Um, in, in really important ways. Um, but in doing so, um, you know, we believe we have to manage that competition responsibly. Um, and that includes by maintaining open lines of communication. President Biden spoke with President Xi three times last year. Um, it includes building guardrails for certain elements of the competition. Um, and it, it really involves keeping the door open for Beijing to work together when it's in our interest to do so on things like climate change and nonproliferation and health security, not as a favor to us or anyone else, but because that's what nations that lead um, do. So um, I, I know we have a lot of time for, for questions ahead, so I'll sort of pause there with, with those opening framing remarks and really look forward to the, the conversation. Thank you very much, Laura. Really appreciate it. And um, now it's my pleasure. I think no no uh, discussion better exemplifies the Wilson Center's commitment to bridging the gaps, bridging the uh, relations between policy and academia by having uh, Laura and our keynote speaker uh, in the same event, Professor Mike Lampton, uh, Professor Emeritus for China Studies at SAIS, uh, PhD from Stanford, uh, home of John Elway. That'll be my last football reference, um, and, but also just one of the leading American scholars on China, his book from 2008, The Three Faces of Chinese Power, Might, Money, and Minds, I think is a masterwork and an essential reading for anybody to understand uh, China. Um, and we're thrilled to have him uh, speak as our keynote speaker for this year's China Fellows Conference. So with that, I'll turn things over to you, Mike. Thank you very much, Abe. and. Uh thank all my colleagues, uh, just to carry on the uh, football analogy, and you 
you mentioned John Elway. I would just point out Stanford always, or at least when I was growing up in Palo Alto, had great quarterbacks. The uh, biggest one being John Brody. Uh, and in fact, he was my idol. So that dates me right there. But uh, in any case, good to be with you. I'm honored to be uh, with this group. And let me offer my uh, congratulations to all of the fellows at the Wilson Center uh, for their achievements in getting there and having such a great environment uh, to work in. And I do want to thank all of the foundations, not least Carnegie, that have supported work in China studies really since the uh, I entered the field in the 1960s. Uh, so uh, plenty of thanks to go around. We don't have uh, time to thank everybody. It should be. But uh, anyway, I'm, I'm honored to have the opportunity to talk to the China fellows. I've been asked to address the subject of U.S.-China relations and the state of the field facing young scholars. So let me dive right in because time is short. But I have several principal points I want to make to spark discussion. I do want to talk about research-related challenges ahead. A little background. First, I, I entered the China field formally in 1969. The Cultural Revolution was underway in the PRC. The Vietnam War was at its height, as was domestic turmoil in the United States. Popular images of China in much of the world were of Mao-inspired domestic savagery, sponsorship of third world revolution, and intimidation of Taiwan and Hong Kong. So when I announced to my father in the late 60s I was going to study China, his natural question was, who's going to pay you to do that? As a businessman, he saw few opportunities and great risks in the 1960s at that time. As I entered the field, I could look forward to a professional life of reading radio broadcast transcripts and pilfered printed materials from the mainland, sometimes by the Guomindang. And I could look forward to occasional periods living along the periphery of China, principally Hong Kong and Taiwan. And I would have the opportunity to interview refugees and be hunkered down in archives around the world. There was considerable interaction among scholars and the intelligence community in those days. And that raised its own issues in academe about intellectual integrity the transparency of research funding, and the public availability of research findings from classified materials. I had no expectation of ever going to mainland China, let alone did I expect to build a career on field research interviews and archival research in the PRC. As it in fact worked out for me, I had relatively unconstrained access to people, places, and institutions in greater China for nearly 40 years. That wasn't something I prepared for initially. Of course, there were limits on that access, and the limits that, such as they were were much greater at some period in those 40 years than at others. But nonetheless, I lived in Wuhan and traveled around Hubei in 1982, studying management and planning of the Yangtze River Valley. In 1990, I spent nearly three weeks with then Shanghai Mayor Zhu Rongji, touring the US in the wake of the June 4th uh, massacre. Among the lessons I draw from all of this include you never know how the march of events is going to unfold. Be flexible. Have your radar set to a broad range of topics. But be opportunistic. Have an ongoing set of research themes and intellectual frameworks that have long-term value themselves. 
and specific research projects can help you explore and refine. Think comparatively, either comparing subjects within China or between China and other societies. Have more than one functional or territorial arrow in your intellectual quiver. Don't stake everything on access to China. Second, turning to today and your challenges, the current and likely future state of US-China relations means that all of us are going to have to develop and employ new tools, artificial intelligence, big data, overhead imaging platforms, and internet and cyber tools. Just even when I was uh, much, much younger in the early 1980s, I was studying a, a Politburo member, a person named uh, Ji Dung Kui, who had risen, like as they said, by helicopter in the Cultural Revolution, a CIA, and uh, much of the US government knew virtually nothing about him. So I found a government agency that actually sold uh, to the public uh, images and you send the coordinates and uh, over China and they would send back uh, by mail in a tube a big picture of the coordinates you gave. I wanted to know the area that this Ji Dung Wei was uh, rising in to get a sense of the terrain and the problems he faced. It was invaluable. So here you had a kind of, at that point, high tech approach to substitute for inability to go to China, I found it very useful. I think we're gonna to have to have that kind of creativity going forward. Third, the current state of US-China relations is the worst since before Nixon and Kissinger went to China in the early 1970s. Even the June 1989 tragedies aftermath we had both George Herbert Walker Bush and Deng Xiaoping pushing to keep things on the rails because both of them viewed Sino-American ties as still strategically critical and uh, basically as still a shared interest. To put it mildly, neither national leadership is today in even remotely the same frame of mind, instead seeing each other as rivals. Today, in the context of the Ukraine crisis, for example, both China and Russia are saying that there are, quote, no limits to their strategic partnership. By way of contrast, in 2008, with respect to Moscow's attempt to dismember the Caucasus state of Georgia, China leaned toward the West to discourage Moscow from violating a sovereign border. Today, we see quite different behavior by Beijing. Indeed, you can see it in this morning's paper, Beijing and the USSR seem to be reinforcing each other in the UN Security Council, not only on Ukraine, but the DPRK as well. This PRC behavior will further erode the degree to which economic and people-to-people -people exchanges can act as a stabilizing counterbalance in US-China relations. Though we should try to energize economic and cultural interaction, that's not how things are going. Ironically, this year, indeed this month, is the 50th anniversary of Nixon and Mao moving toward each other to limit and shape Soviet behavior. Now, on that anniversary, Moscow and Beijing are moving toward each other to counter US strength and to influence and establish their respective spheres of influence. Frankly, I think Beijing has turned away from a much more successful past policy of reassurance of neighbors and the broader international system using principally economic, and cultural means to do so. Of course, COVID's exacerbated everybody's problems, but Beijing is just quite simply seeming 
to care less what others think. Of course, America's own governance is less than that shining city on the hill that we talk about. The US is not, as uh, Laura suggested, not sufficiently invested in its own comprehensive capacities and the US is strategically overstretched. All of this is gonna present you younger scholars and researchers focused on China. Some of the same dilemmas I faced when setting out on this path more than 50 years ago. Of course, you certainly will also confront new challenges that my, me and my colleagues never thought of. But let me just tick off a few things that I think are, you might keep in mind. Scholars are going to have to decide how close do you want to be to intelligence agencies? This was an issue for us in the Vietnam War. From whom are you willing to accept financial support? And how demanding will you be to acknowledge whatever connections you may have in this regard in your public research. I am glad to actually talk to anybody about my experience, which on balance was very positive with the CIA in the late 1970s and 80s and uh, uh, getting the permissions to uh, publish my work openly. As a starting point though, I would say, or at least my position would be, err on the side of transparency. Two, young scholars are going to have to decide how much weight to give studying China's internal politics versus its international behavior. My view has been that domestic politics shapes international behavior to a considerable extent. Though my work on US-China relations and related foreign policy uh, issues took a lot of my time, I've always conceived of myself, at least, as paying most attention to domestic developments in China. And that's going to be harder to do, given the trends I've outlined. Three, as China becomes relatively more inaccessible to direct domestic observation, we are going to have to develop new platforms from which to view and interact with China particularly given changes in Hong Kong. Also, we will need more, more sometimes big comparative studies of China in interaction with others. I'm glad to talk about my big five-year project with colleagues on Chinese involvement in Southeast Asia, constructing high-speed rails. Four, scholars, as they always have, must decide what balance to give to the development of frameworks of analysis of China on the one hand and policy work on the uh, other hand that often brings faster gratification and more rewards, but its durability can fade with changing events and agendas. All I would say is that trying to develop perspectives that illuminate deeper behavior and the reasons for it can be gratifying and enduring. Five, as Chinese Americans, Chinese students studying in America, and perhaps even other scholars in the China field itself, come under more domestic pr pressure and suspicion each scholar is going to have to decide when and how to stand up for what, after all, we like to think makes us Americans, namely openness and tolerance. Six and finally, my last point will be debatable for some, perhaps many, but I think the question needs to be raised pointedly. What are the dangers and risks of the present course on which the United States and China are now set? If you see things going in an unsustainable direction destined to break down, what are you prepared to do about it, to say about it? Is it sensible? Uh, by way of closing, never stop asking, 
uh, never stop uh, listening to what the Chinese tell you. I said, listen to everything. I did not say, believe everything. I was struck by a recent speech of Tsinghua professor Yen Shui Tung, with whom I often find myself differing. In July, 2021, he gave a speech in Beijing that I thought was brave and valuable in the current setting of China. He called for promoting the development of knowledge, not propaganda. He called for promoting study grounded in humane values, which is not dominant in China at the moment. And he implored his listeners not to just seek celebrity. I look forward to my colleagues' comments, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, very helpful, very interesting advice, um, as well as a great review of your of your history and background. Um, we can now open things up for discussion. Uh, if Ambassador uh, Green or Steve have any questions uh, or comments they'd like to make, please please go ahead. Um, Abe, I'll jump in. So I was struck by something that Laura said with respect to the uh, the new Indo-Pacific strategy that the NSC has released. And uh, Laura, you uh, said that we have limited ability to change China, so we're focusing essentially on the terrain around China. And I think that's an important point to be made because I think much of uh, America's foreign policy right now with respect to China is in contrast to that, right? I think there is the sense that uh, by some that through countering China, moving the chess pieces or a combination of sanctions and such, we can change China. But uh, it seems as though what the administration is saying is that a competition means understanding not simply China, but all of the players uh, around China, both geographically and uh, economically, and, and as well as uh, from a security perspective. Have I got that right? Well, thanks, Ambassador. Yeah, I think I would just elaborate on the point to say that certainly tools like sanctions and other sorts of export control restrictions, other sorts of measures um, are important for protecting our national security, right? And, and in some cases, our, our values, um, particularly when it comes to, to uh, the PRC's human rights abuses. Um, that's kind of the defensive piece of the equation, right? Um, and to the degree that we can, we do want to do that in conjunction with, with allies and partners. Um, but at the same time, I think, you know, our goal is um, through those tools and then through the affirmative pieces that we want to move on the um, on the chessboard to make sure that what we are doing is building um, our resilience at home, our resilience collectively with allies and partners um, in order to limit the impact of or the effectiveness of the PRC's coercive and abusive behaviors. Um, so in some ways, it's essentially saying, you know, we need to, in many ways, um, you know, recognize the challenge that we face and ensure that we are making our societies and our investments and our innovation, all of these pieces, um, as resilient as possible um, in the face of what is likely to continue to be the policy and approach that Xi Jinping is going to be prosecuting. Mike, wondering if you um, want to chime in on, in your experience, past efforts that the United States has had to try to shape Chinese decision making to influence their domestic politics um, and um, how you think that's gone within the context of uh, what Laura was just describing. Well, I, I had a, a number of reactions and I uh, agree with uh, ver a lot, most of what uh, Laura said. I think past efforts, when if we talk back to the heyday of, of engagement and what influence did we have on changing China, I mentioned in passing, mayor of Shanghai before he became premier, Zhu Rongji's trip to the US. And I, as I said, spent three weeks with him and I could see the impact that, for instance, going through the Chicago mercantile exchange into the trading pits, 
And he said, walking through, he says, you can feel the strength and innovation of capitalism. And I mean, this wasn't some phony expression. He, I think, was surprised. And he went back to China. He was also very impressed with the Federal Reserve and using monetary policy and interest rates and reserve ratios. So he learned an enormous amount of economics and, uh, and, and went back and implemented it and housing reform. So I th they were, of course, all these things were adapted. He had to fight his internal opposition. But I think on the economic front, particularly, you can argue that at least at the height of engagement, particularly when China was trying to fit back into the world a little more comfortably after Tiananmen, it really, and it had Jiang Zemin, who was relatively speaking, open to Western ideas, considered himself Western oriented. So I would say, you know, but if you say changing the nature of the political system, the high watermark was probably uh, Jiang Zemin's uh, three represents the idea the party needed to be a broader uh, tent for a variety of interests. And so I think, you know, politically over the long run, uh, our attempts to shape development uh, at least is a little harder to see. But uh, I think it's easily uh, easy to become um, um, taken away with the idea we can change China. I think Laura, if I understood her correctly, expressed it. It's we can shape the environment and uh, more easily, perhaps, than we can change the dynamic internally. So uh, I, I would just say one other thing, though, that I haven't heard, and nor I was going to raise it and then felt I was going on too long. And that is, the United States seems to me finds it very difficult to set priorities. I said we were strategically overstretched. I mean, now we got problems in the heart of Europe. We've, of course, had ongoing problems in Central Asia, Middle East, South Asia, uh, and, and now, obviously, the Pacific in an in a increasingly worrisome way. R right now, it seems like we, well, if we set a priority, I suppose it's China as the biggest long-term problem. But, but I think we have, we've got to decide here how we're going to focus resources. Uh, I, I don't have an answer, but it seems to me that uh, we're not making choices. And if I were to pick among all the threats, I, I don't know. I, I'm ambivalent on this, but I don't think I would put China at the top of the list. But I'd like to hear more discussion about our priorities uh, and uh, is our current behavior going to create the pro a bigger problem than we already have? And I hope my remarks made it clear. I think China's gone substantially in a way that's not either consistent fully with its past policy or its future interests. Thanks, Mike. And I, although I would note that we have the Secretary of State going to in Australia, meeting with uh, members of the Quad and conducting a trilat meeting in the middle of a crisis between uh, Russia, Ukraine, and the rest of NATO. So that, that to me, suggests a pretty high uh, priority for, for these issues. You're right. That's uh, right. That's right. Steve, Mark, uh, wondering if, if you have anything, uh, yeah, I, uh, other I comments, to, uh, questions? I wanted to respond to um, Professor Lampton's uh, image of, of Jiang Zemin on the floor of the uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And the, um, the, the way that underscores the, um, the real need to be on the ground. I mean, um, Professor Lampton made some very wise uh, remarks about the need for flexibility for, for China scholars and, and um, cataloged a number of, uh, of new technologies that weren't available when, um, when he was uh, first starting out as a researcher. But um, I, I think any of the, the China fellows at the Wilson Center recognize that there is no real substitute for being on the ground, um, but we have to live with the, the constraints that we have. And uh, Professor Lampton mentioned uh, big data, mentioned some other technologies. We've supported uh, a couple of projects to try to, um, I wouldn't say replace, but supplement the need that remains to be on the ground. One is the CSIS's um, open source 
uh, project, China project, which is um, trying to translate uh, important documents and speeches from Chinese officials. It's it's uh, not ideal, but it, it's one way to to uh, have a glimpse of what's going on. The Asia Society has a China visibility project that is also uh, using the internet and uh, some of the open source material there to try to provide researchers with that material. So um, we're hoping that at some point, you know, Carnegie and several other foundations uh, have supported um, <laughs> the, uh, well, it isn't the Fulbright program, but a, a semblance of Fulbright China program that was canceled by the last administration to allow American uh, student of researchers to go to China, China researchers to go to the States. Currently, the Chinese researchers are able to come here. Um, American researchers are having some difficulty going to China. So we have to be cognizant of the constraints that exist and hope that uh, this is temporary, um, at least uh, it'll be a short-term or medium-term problem that someday will be able to be resolved by people getting on the ground. So. Um, we, we try to do what we can in the interim. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Ambassador Green, did you have comments, questions you want to add? So, um, so I guess I have a question for both Laura and, uh, and for Mike, and, and that's really around the impact of COVID, right? So, I, and I don't mean in the sense of uh, international travel, I think that's obvious, but clearly COVID and the consequences of COVID have led to increased distrust of research exchanges between China and the U.S. And uh, what I'm hearing from all the panelists is while we understand some of that, we also have to get back to a place where there are information exchanges, where there are fellowships and, and scholarship and cultural exchanges. So I guess the question is, uh, uh, you know, what do the other panelists see as the possibilities in this current political environment in the era of, uh, of COVID? Um, maybe I'd take a stab at it. it uh, early in my career, I studied public health in China. Uh, and so it's always been an interest. And I must say when the pandemic first broke out, and I do subscribe to the notion that China tried to whitewash and hide the whole thing and, and that compounded problems of all sorts. So I don't even vaguely dispute that. But I, that aside, I thought we would both come to our senses and find a way to cooperate because it seemed so self-evidently in both our interests. And one of the most disturbing things to come out of this whole recent two years is we can't even act in our respective self-interest with respect to COVID uh, cooperation and so forth. I thought the last administration made some big mistakes and Laura will correct me if I'm wrong, but we used to have quite a bit of CDC cooperation and personnel in China. Previous administration pulled most of that out just when it turns out we needed it. We'd prior to that and previous administrations had great cooperation on flu and pretty good cooperation on Ebola. The NSC used to have a capacity to look at these diseases of viral diseases, uh, but just before this crisis, uh, that office was either merged or uh, otherwise weakened in the NSC as I understand. So I think we made some uh, bureaucratic mistakes in the sense of uh, pulling out our capacity just at the right moment, notwithstanding. I would just close by saying, I think the, uh, with respect to COVID, in a sense, the Chinese government, by being able to close down China with a plausible medical rationale, which admittedly they've not lost remotely the number of people we have, but, but in any case, this is a kind of political godsend for those in China that want to exert control and create insulation from foreign influence, particularly until after the 20th Party Congress. And I think China's also embarrassed that its vaccines aren't as effective as they could be, should be. In any event, I think they're embarrassed that they're not performing as well 
on that. But the fact that we're now not recognizing each other's vaccines is yet just another problem. So I think the most disturbing thing going on is we can't even act in what's in demonstrably our respective needs. I'll just add a few points to what, what Mike has, has laid out here. Um, we, you know, certainly from the Biden administration, um, as I sort of mentioned in my opening remarks, believe that health security um, should be one of the areas where the United States and China um, are able to work together because we do think that our interests align. Um, it's one of these sort of existential issues um, for the world's people. Um, and COVID uh, has you know, repeatedly underscored, I think, um, the connectivity um, uh, between um, you know, nations across the globe um, and that you know, we cannot uh, really get the, you know, the pandemic under control um, in one place until we have addressed it globally. Um, that's actually why we've invited um, you know, Chinese officials, senior uh, Chinese officials um, to the various multilateral um, convenings that we've hosted um, on COVID. Um, uh, we've uh, invited them to, to be at the table, to be a constructive contributor um, to the, the public good um, through those, uh, through those um, uh, groupings um, and, and continue to believe that that it is um, you know, in China's interest um, to do that. Um, the president has also, I think to some of Mike's points, um, directly underscored to, to Xi Jinping, um, the importance of transparency as a norm on uh, things like um, you know, viruses with pandemic potential, whether it's COVID-19 or flu or other things. Um, to that end, we, we do have um, CDC on the ground um, in our mission in China. Um, we do believe that those sorts of um, uh, those sorts of engagements uh, between our health officials um, at a technical level is really important, and we do have open lines of, of communication there. Um, I think that there's still a lot more that we are hoping to see from Beijing in terms of um, making good on that that transparency piece. Um, but we do agree that that this is absolutely an area where we should be able, um, and that it's really again in the public interest to to do so. But the last thing I would say, and, and I think Mike made the good point about um, how the, the COVID restrictions are, are playing out in a way um, that has some domestic advantage uh, from sort of cutting, cutting things off. But the other thing that we have seen Beijing doing really from the early days of the pandemic um, is, is trying to promote its model. Um, through the way that it has been uh, dealing with, with COVID-19. Um, and I think we, we continue to see that um, even you know, in and around the, the Olympics um, and, and uh, you know, as China has been wrestling with how to address the, the Omicron variants spread within, within China. Um, and so I think that you know, we've um, seen again, the way that, that Beijing has dealt with the pandemic sort of through that lens, um, you know, Beijing sort of taking it through that lens of how to promote its model um, in the way that it is dealing with this public health crisis. Great, thanks, thanks, Lauren. Thank you, Mike. Uh, other questions and comments? Um, I had um, one question for, for Mike, um, pulling things to current day issues, um, if we could. Um, and this relates to um, reporting we've seen recently about um, uh, Russia uh, gearing up potentially for some aggressive action against Ukraine, potentially a full scale invasion of that country during the Olympics um, in Beijing. Uh, not the first time they've uh, conducted some military action during an Olympics in Beijing. Um, but curious that this comes as relations between Beijing and Moscow are particularly warm. So curious, uh, Mike, from your perspective, um, how do you expect Beijing would see the potential for such action, both in terms of uh, the Olympics themselves, but also in terms of uh, their relationship with Russia and Beijing's efforts to portray themselves as an international leader? Well, um, I, what should be obvious is I don't know. I can speculate, and I will speculate. Please, but, please. Uh, I I would say that the first cut of an answer is China wouldn't be happy because China doesn't like people raining on their parades, whatever it is. 
uh, but probably wouldn't say much because at this point, then the natural question is, but why didn't you try to restrain them earlier rather than adopt the line that we currently see? So I would say wouldn't make them happy, probably wouldn't say much and would not have a fundamental impact on China's direction of alignment. I mean, I think the driver is as long as we are defining each other as strategic rivals, then the irritants in, the, and there are many irritants in Russia-China relations, historically and currently, but they're irritants, they're not strategic problems. So as long as they see themselves with a strategic problem with us and tactical day-to-day -day irritations on the other hand, I think they're gonna sublimate at least publicly. Now, I presume they'll say privately to the Russians, they're not particularly happy, but I don't think that's gonna shape much of anybody's behavior. And I'm not sure they're gonna, the Russians are gonna attack in the next five days or whatever. I, I have no knowledge of that. Does that right. address your question? I think so. I thought as, as good of uh, informed speculation as, as I've heard so far on the subject. Um, we just have a couple minutes left in the session. Uh, Mark, Steve, Laura, if you have any closing thoughts or comments you wanted to make before we close out. Uh, let me just say that um, another tool in the toolbox that um, that Mike didn't have in 1969 uh, for engaging with the Chinese, of course, is Zoom and uh, the same technology we're talking on today. But as, as we've discovered, and I'm sure um, people are, uh, who are listening have discovered that while Zoom has allowed um, engagement with the Chinese, maybe more people in a Zoom call that would be uh, in, in private meetings, it has some, um, we, we've noticed a, a certain reticence on the part of the Chinese interlocutors for reasons that you can surmise. So while uh, some of that, that uh, engagement goes on, um, there are also constraints uh, that the technology uh, can't get over for the moment. If, if I could, I would just make sort of one broader comment. Um, uh, which again speaks to sort of the whole purpose of the, the fellowship and to the, these two days, which is just, you know, given, um, you know, the, the intense competition, again, as I said at the top, we believe will be a, a long-term one. Um, it is unbelievably important that whether it's in government, whether it's in the private sector, whether it's in academia, um, that we have a, a deep bench of, of people with um, knowledge um, about China. Um, you know, and again, it's it's not just in the policy circles. I spend a lot of time um, talking with with you know senior officials in the in the private sector, CEOs and others, um, who are trying to you know better understand what are the dynamics happening in China, how to think about U.S.-China relations uh, with respect to the decisions that they're taking. Um, it relates to the uh, questions on on technology, on, on research more broadly, um, and so I just really want to to underscore from where I sit. Um, that one of the most important um, aspects of, of sort of thinking about um, our own sort of, you know, strengthening our own competitive hand is really our talent. Um, it is really making sure that we have um, a deep bench, um, you know, at the table um, for the road ahead. Uh, so just really want to underscore the importance of the work that everybody here um, is doing uh, to ensure that, that we are able to advance um, our interests and values going forward. Very well said. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, and thank you, Mike Lampton. Thank you, Steve Del Rosso. Thank you, Ambassador Green. It's been an excellent beginning to the second uh, uh, conference for our Wilson China Fellowship. Um, for those of you watching, we're going to take a brief break and we'll start again at 1030 for our first uh, panel with these uh, China fellows, with the, these uh, folks on the bench, as Laura described them. Um, it's going to be on the US-China trade war, multinationals, and China's economy with Robert Daly, who's the director of the Kissinger Institute on China in the United States, with Michael Beckley, uh, who's an associate professor at Tufts University, Ling Chung, who's an associate professor at Johns Hopkins, uh, Ann Kokus, an associate professor at University of Virginia, and Jack Zhang, 
associate professor at the University of Kansas. Uh, so thank you all for joining us. Uh, thank you all uh, for uh, watching. And especially thank you to Laura for taking busy time out of your day and Professor Lampton for such interesting keynote remarks. And of course, to uh, Stephen Del Rosso and the Carnegie Corporation of New York for supporting this uh, ex exceptional project and program that we have. Uh, and until then, we'll see you all at 1030. Thank you.